I want to say good morning to you and of course express to you how great it is to see everyone, how great it is to be in your presence and to collectively know that you and I are in the presence of God, that it's a great thing to be able to come out on the first day of the week and worship our great God in spirit and in truth through his son, his one and only son, Jesus the Christ. It's just a great uh, privilege for us to be here. And even though uh, many are uh, away uh, traveling um, and some are sick uh, and there are various um, reasons why uh, some are not here this morning, um, though we are smaller in number, it's just great to, to be uh, shoulder to shoulder with God's people, uh, people of like mind, of like faith, coming together for the same purpose, to worship the one true God, because we are convinced that he is worthy of our worship. And so it's just great to be here. Uh, this morning, I want to talk to you on the subject, briefly on the subject, uh, about milestones. Milestones that are necessary for us to achieve as Christians in certain areas of our lives where we ought to um, achieve certain milestones. In fact, I'm going to ask you if you would turn to Matthew chapter 5. I want to read this again together because from Jesus' teaching we're going to lift uh, an ancient reality, a reality of the ancient world that Jesus is referring to here uh, in order to bring our lesson today. Matthew chapter 5. Those babies were happy when they were coming in here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And, verse 41, if anyone forces you, compels you, as the older translations say, forces you to go uh, one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Let's go to God. Again, Father, we thank you for this time and this opportunity for us to be here. We thank you for your son and for all of the blessings that we receive in him. We pray now that as we study your word together, as we collectively strive to learn from you, Lord, we pray that we're learning the value of, of focusing on your word, being receptive to your word, applying meekness in our lives, knowing that through meekness, we can receive, and only through meekness, receive your word, which is able to save our souls. We pray that we're learning the value of looking past the speaker by faith and looking to you, knowing that everything that is good and right and true and eternal belong to you, and all the mistakes, all of the communicative deficiencies belong to the speaker. These things we pray and ask in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. A graduation. A graduation denotes that one has achieved a personal level in a specific area of that person's life. We even think of graduations as, or we think of them as a, a time where we've set certain goals and where those particular goals have been finished. We think about graduating academically or even certain uh, graduations spiritually or, or otherwise, we, we tend to think of the concept of graduation uh, as something that we have finished, a goal that we have finished in certain areas of our lives. Graduating often implies reaching a certain milestone in one's life, which means that one has traveled a certain distance in order to reach that certain milestone, milestones in life. Initially, uh, milestones were literal land markers or road markers made of stone like granite 
Uh, they were made of, of marble or some other type of stone. And these markers in, in the ancient world were, were placed down the road to indicate to the traveler, uh, first of all, how far they traveled, but also how close that they were to their desired uh, destination. This is what the ancient Romans did. Rome also had milestones or road markers, and this is what Jesus is referring to in Matthew chapter 5, verse 41. We know, again, how there were um, those under Roman rule that if a Roman centurion or a Roman soldier compelled you to carry his, his uh, belongings one mile, Jesus tells his disciples to do what? To carry them too, to go uh, the extra mile. And so Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 41 is teaching his disciples the value of giving more than one may expect in order to, to show that one belongs to him, giving more than what is desired or what is sometimes often required. And through wisdom, we ought to, to, to heed to the words of the Lord Jesus when we are compelled by someone to go uh, a certain distance. Uh, metaphorically or literally to prove that we uh, belong to Christ in those ways and go an extra mile. We primarily think of a milestone as an important point or a place that one has reached in their development uh, of a certain area of life, an event that marks a significant change or a stage in development. So we think of it, we don't think of it in terms of how they did in the ancient world necessarily as often as we think about it in terms of of certain goals that we strive to reach. Now during this time of year, uh, it has been customary and it is uh, of course true for us today that we are celebrating our graduates. Uh, and we have a couple of graduates and for those who are, who are older and, and have raised children, those of us who have raised children, those of us who are raising children or even to some extent helping with grandchildren, we know that graduating even high school uh, it is a very uh, challenging task. We know that for one to graduate high school is a greater achievement today than it was in past generations. Uh, it really is uh, an achievement, not referring only to the academic dedication that is needed. In indeed, it, it is required that one, of course, um, is academically dedicated in order to graduate even high school, but more than that, Young people face many obstacles and require great focus just to accomplish the task of finishing school that go far beyond academics, far beyond the dedication to their books. For example, we know that in our world there has been an increase in violence, not just from, from street to street, but young people see violence sometimes often and more often than we see in the neighborhoods. There has been, over the last several decades, an increase in violence and threats of violence. This is challenging for young people in life today. It's challenging when, when young people, uh, even in the most and the deepest parts of suburbia or whatever our so-called safest neighborhoods may be, no high school is necessarily safe. And we've seen that over and over again where children have had to deal with and have had the anxiety of dealing from day to day with violence or whether or not their school will be attacked by an, uh, an individual or individuals that want to do someone harm. So young people face that. Young people face the rapid access to worldly things which make fighting temptations a constant struggle. Young people today have to deal with things on a higher level than we did because of, of this world that we have uh, developed and what we are really entering into, whether you think about things virtually and over the internet. Young people face uh, a rapid excess of, of worldly things and they really are just a, a hand away or a, a, a button away from certain things in this life, worldly things that, that often can cause them to struggle. Social pressures. Uh, young people face social pressures. People are encouraged, and especially young people are encouraged to have a public persona. Young people today, we, we were growing up, we just went to high school, and, and maybe we were on a, a sporting team, and we had to live up to, to a certain um, sporting persona or an athletic persona, but now uh, children have to have, and they're pressured to what? Have their own individual persona, and they are encouraged all the more to be on 
uh, line virtually and have virtual mediums of communication. We didn't have to deal with those things, but young people do. Think about ungodly philosophies that young people are, are dealing with today. You know, we dealt with, with certain things growing up, but now young people have, they're saturated with all of these uh, erroneous philosophies, all of these devilish ideas they are plagued with, and even young people of faith, they, they have to deal with these things every day and hold on and maintain to their, their faith in the Lord Jesus. Ungodly philosophies that are becoming more mainstream every single day. Think about that. Young people, what we knew and what we were taught was clearly wrong and clearly immoral. Now young people are growing up into a world where certain immoralities are now taught as if they're mainstream and they are taught as if they are the really the moral things to do, the loving things to do. And so when a young person graduates, especially a Christian young person, we need to understand that honor and recognition is due to many. And when, when one graduates, high school even, that, that it's not the efforts of one person, that there are various people that deserve to be honored, that need to be honored for this achievement, for this milestone. First, of course, there's the young person to recognize. Again, for a Christian youth that graduates, that holds on to his or her faith throughout what they go through uh, concerning high school. But young people that graduate, and as a whole, overall, need to, to have a, a certain gratitude to their parents because no child graduates apart from someone helping them. And oftentimes, it's a loving parent or loving parents that have gotten you to that point. And God will bless the grateful child, the child that recognizes mom and dad's love, that recognizes mom and dad's dedication. So I, I do, I urge young people to, to just have a heart of gratitude and thank God if you are, uh, are experiencing a, a period where you're graduating from high school or from college, thank God for loving parents who were dedicated to seeing you through this task because it is not easy as parents. And without your parents, you could not have made it. And then finally, there is an honor that we all must pay to our great God, whether it's through uh, honoring God through safety, bringing a child safely through, or whether, again, giving them the intellect and the fortitude to press on. See, if we go back to the Lord's word, I want to use this time when we're talking about graduating and milestones, not to just encourage the young people, but for all of us to look at God's glorious word and understand that there are milestones that we all must achieve in life. We should never as Christians believe that we have arrived at any area of our life, but that as Christians we need to understand that there are milestones that we must travel past in order to get to greater milestones and greater achievements, all for the glory and the honor of our great God through his son, Jesus the Christ. We all ought to think about this Christian life and what it entails. If we go back to the Lord's word in Matthew chapter 5, verse 41, Jesus is talking about being compelled by others, being compelled, being compelled. But most of all, he's talking about going further, isn't he? Going further. And so we want to combine these two concepts in terms of milestones. So I would like to think about being compelled to travel and all of us being compelled to reach certain milestones in life during this time where we celebrate our young people, we all want to be encouraged today as Christians. See, there are certain areas of life where we cannot stop moving, brothers and sisters. I don't care how old you are, how long you've been in the Lord's church, as a Christian, there are certain areas of life where we cannot afford, for eternal sake, we cannot afford to stop progressing. We cannot afford to stop moving. And Christianity is a, a faith, it is a life, it is a religion that demands, because of our great God and because of our Lord Jesus, it demands that we do what? That we progress. It is not a religion that one can achieve and that one can master. It is not something that we can say that we have reached that goal. What did Paul say in the book of Philippians? He says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own yet, but this one thing I do. Here's the man, the apostle Paul, who understood the, the importance of what? 
progression. So we want to encourage you today, no matter who you are, that there are certain areas of life that we cannot afford to stop moving, but rather we must continue, continue incrementally to progress in passing, passing milestones. And of course, also in reaching others. So I wanted to talk about that this morning. To our graduates, we always remind you, and I would be remiss if I didn't remind you, that when we celebrate you this time of year, that while academic achievement is of great value, isn't it? It's of great benefit. But as Paul says, godliness is beneficial in every way. Christ is beneficial in every way. And while we encourage our young people to strive academically and to go to higher education and higher learning and to do their best and glorify God in that manner, never forget the spiritual valuables in life. And that's not just for our young people. That's for every one of us today. We are often tempted to look past and to think that as Christians, we have certain things handled and certain things nailed down. But in reality, just like our graduates, we ought to put Christ first. We ought to put him first. We ought to put the kingdom first. We ought to dedicate ourselves to it. For young people, it's not the most important thing that you get a college degree. It is a wonderful thing to achieve academic excellence and success. But no one will stand before God and will be able to hold up that they graduated from Yale University or from Harvard or wherever it may be. We want to hear the Lord say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, because we have progressed in the spiritual and the eternal things. All Christians should understand that there are areas in life where we are compelled to continue to move and advance in life. And I want us to think about it in that way, that the love of Christ, our love for God, compels us to do what? To, to move forward in life. Number one, we ought to reach milestones, pass milestones and reach milestones concerning faith, concerning our faith. Now by faith, we mean your individual, your own personal conviction that brought you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was a wonderful thing. The day that you said that I want to be baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins, I want to obey the gospel, that was a glorious thing, a glorious decision, a glorious day, a glorious act. But understand that that was just the beginning. Only the beginning that we have been placed here to progress and to show the fruit of progression as it regards to our faith, your belief in Jesus and the Son of God and his Lordship. You ought to progress in that. How do you progress in that? I want you to consider three things in three ways that you progress in your faith. Number one, progressing in your faith and in order to pass and reach certain milestones, number one, think about the fact that we have to learn how to daily express our faith in him. The Bible calls us, every one of us as Christians, to learn how to daily express our faith in him. Daily expression. Daily expression of faith. One who truly has faith in Jesus and in his lordship, they understand the value of expressing that faith daily. And they understand the value of learning how to do that from his glorious word. Of course, it means that we study. So why is it so important? So we could, we could preach all year. If I wanted to do a year's worth of study of why we ought to study the Bible, I could find 365 reasons why we ought to study the scriptures. And one of them is to do what? To learn how to express our faith toward the Lord. You cannot properly please God. You cannot properly walk by faith. You cannot properly express your faith and your love to God without a word from the Lord himself. We have to study the word of God. We cannot truly walk by faith unless we truly know what God commands and what God requires of us and learn the meaning of his word. Learning the meaning of his word. 
It's not enough for us to just say that we know scripture and that we can recite scripture and we can quote scripture. We have to know what scripture means. We have to know the meaning of it. We have to know how to walk in it. I'm going to ask you if you would turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And look at what the Apostle Paul is saying. In, in, in Thessalonians, Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, they're believed by scholars to be some of Paul's first and some of his earliest epistles. And, and so, uh, and the church at Thessalonica is believed, now hear me now, they're believed to be a, a, a tender group of believers. New converts at the time of Paul's writing. And so it's often believed that the things that Paul is writing to them were the basics of Christianity. Now we have to look at our lives and see whether or not we are continuing in these basic things, these foundational things, these elementary things, so that we can continue to have a firm foundation in order to build spiritually on these things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at what the Apostle Paul says to these believers here. He says in chapter 4, verse 1, 1 and 2, he concludes, he says, Finally, brothers, we ask. Now, this word finally here in the Greek, it does not denote that Paul is bringing it into the letter. What Paul is saying is he's calling in the Greek a, a, a greater attention. He's telling them to continue to do what? Pay attention to what I'm saying. Everything that I have said thus far is important, but now here, don't lax in it. Continue to pay attention. Wake up, in other words, and listen to what I'm saying. He says, finally, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you learned from us. See, we ought to learn from God himself through his word. He says, we ask and urge you that as you learn from us, how you ought to live. Paul, you're saying to me that I don't know how to live unless God teaches me how to live. That's exactly what I'm saying. This Christian walk is a walk that has to be learned on how to do it. Step by step. I cannot take a proper step apart from God's word. And so Paul says, we urge you, it's so important that concerning your faith that you learn how to walk and how to express that faith. Don't just say, I believe in the Lord, and then go off and do what you want to do. You have to learn from him what it is of true faith and to have true faith and how to please him. As you've learned from us how you ought to walk or how they ought to live and to please God, as in fact you are doing, Paul says, well, just give up on it because you already know. He says, no, do so what? More and more. Does your Bible say that? He says you should do so more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. We ought to learn how to walk. So the first way in terms of progressing in our faith is learning how to walk. Learning how to express it daily. How do I express it? What do I do in order to please God? I am a person of faith. How do I express that faith to God in a way that pleases him? Well, I have to go to the book and find that out. But number two, concerning this faith, how do I progress in faith? How do I pass milestones? How do I reach milestones of faith? When I set goals in terms of my faith, how do I reach them? Number two, it means becoming fruitful in my faith. I have to produce faith over and over in every day. This comes from doing what? Adding to my faith. Isn't that what the Apostle Peter said? He says, faith is wonderful, but then he says what? Add to your faith. Come on now, virtue. Virtue, knowledge. Knowledge, temperance. Temperance, patience. Patience, godly. Godly, brotherly kindness. And brotherly kindness, love. So faith is wonderful, but there are certain things that I ought to support my faith with. He says, that's how you do what? That's how you produce fruit. This comes by adding to our faith and supporting it with the qualities and the traits that Peter describes in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. He talks about the participants being participants in the divine nature. He says, for if these things are yours and abound, they will keep you from being what? Ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things, they're nearsighted and blind and is forgetful that they have been cleansed from what? From their past sins. 
So in terms of my faith, I, in other words, have to press on and by my faith, I have to produce fruit because if I don't produce fruit, then what's going to happen is that I'm going to focus more on my spiritual deficiencies than what God is accomplishing in me and then I will not be able to serve God as I ought to serve God. But then number three, in terms of my faith, in order to reach these milestones and in order for me to progress, I ought to exercise my faith. I ought to exercise it. I ought to use it daily against the enemy, in other words. See, as Christians, the Bible says we don't run from contending for the faith. We flee the devil in situations, but in terms of contending for the faith, in terms of situations where we have to withstand the devil, the Bible says that we put on the whole armor of God. And in terms of the whole armor of God, he talks about what the shield of faith. Now, what is Paul, what is Paul saying here in Ephesians chapter 6? He's talking about withstanding the daily schemes of the devil. We don't have a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Second, Th Second Timothy chapter 1. In other words, what the Bible is teaching me, in order for me to reach milestones, in order for me, in terms of my faith, to pass and reach certain goals, I have to be able to quench his arrows by my faith. That means, in other words, when I go on the job and folk are challenging me, I don't suppress who I am in Christ Jesus. That means when I have to deal with people in my family who are agnostic or who are atheists or who are antagonistic to God's word, when there is a time for me to stand up and to contend for the faith, I don't shrink, but I confess Jesus daily. I exercise my faith in him daily in order for my faith to become what he wants it to become. That is the manner in which the devil will attempt to weaken us. He will try to throw arrows at us all the time through philosophies and through uh, hardships and through difficulties because Satan wants you to do nothing but to become discouraged in faith and to give up and we're supposed to exercise our faith and to make our faith to such an extent that we're able to do what? We're able to withstand his arrows, all of his flaming arrows. You're only able to withstand when you're able to do what? When you're exercising and your faith becomes strong enough or your faith becomes hard enough to deal with the things in life. So we ought to understand that about our faith. We ought to progress in our faith. But number two, we all ought to progress in our relationships of covenant. We ought to progress in the relationships of our lives. We ought to progress in covenant relationships. We ought to progress and reach milestones really in all of the important relationships of our life, in every relationship that we can. We ought to improve in our relationships with our neighbors. We ought to improve and progress in our relationships with our coworkers as long as it depends on us, as Paul says, to be at peace with all men. But above all of the relationships that we may have, we ought to, most importantly, we ought to progress in relationships of covenant. We have a relationship, we have relationships that are dealing with covenant. Number one, our spouse. For those of us who are married, we ought to, to, to grow. No marriage ought to say, and the folk involved in it ought to say that we're good. We have reached our goal. That's not the purpose. Marriage is designed to glorify God as well because God is the architect of marriage. And every marriage, especially Christians, we ought to understand that a husband and a wife, they are put together to, of course, produce children and, of course, to bring a certain level of contentment. But marriage, above all, is designed to bring glory to the God who created it and who created you. We ought to be intentional in terms of progressing in our covenant with our spouse. 
We look at passages like Ephesians chapter 5 and it's telling husbands to love their wives and wives to respect their husbands. That's a progression and, we, and husbands and wives ought to grow in their love for, for one another. We ought to dedicate ourselves to, to reading the Old Testament book, the Song of Solomon. Oftentimes it's attributed to being a book about Christ and the church, but in reality, it's really implied to be a book about what? Romantic relationships. And when you look at the Song of Solomon, this wonderful, wonderful book about a husband and a wife, you see a husband and a wife, first of all, a man and a woman courting one another, but also when they get married, that progression of marriage. They start off as young people, and by the end of the book, they have progressed to be older people, and now they're encouraging and instructing young people about marriage. That's what marriage is designed to do. We ought to grow in that covenant relationship of marriage. The intimacy between a husband and a wife. And that's not always dealing with physical uh, things. That has to do with an intimacy mentally. Husbands and wives ought to be best friends and they ought to have a great communication and it ought to increase and it ought to grow because they're exercising communication to one another. That glorifies God and we ought to progress in that area. We should never think of ourselves as being so familiar with one another that we have given up on learning and growing together and in one another, in knowledge of one another. We ought to grow in that relationship of covenant. We ought to grow in our relationship with each other. Don't you know that we are in a covenant relationship with Christ and therefore we are in a covenant relationship with one another? Jesus talks about this covenant that has been enacted by his blood in Matthew 26, verse 26. And we are members of his body together, brothers and sisters. And I should not say that I've come to worship, I've done my part, I've sang, I've listened to the sermon, I've given, and now I'm going home, and I don't care if I talk to any of them this week, I'll see them Wednesday or Sunday. That's not how it's designed. We ought to grow in our love for one another. As we talked about in Sunday school, we ought to grow in our relationship because after all, together we are in this covenant with who? With Christ. With God through his son, Jesus the Christ, his blood. And local congregations. It was a wonderful thing what we did yesterday. So grateful to our sister uh, Connie and Brother Marvin. And just all that they did. And just uh, the wonderful uh, time that we were able to spend. And we ought to do things like that more. With each other. Whether we do that in small groups and we get to know each other, too often do church members have a greater intimacy with folk in the world than they do in the Lord's church. And we need to encourage each other. This is uh, the true fellowship in God's word. This is an exercise of us being in the fellowship. But it's nothing biblical for us on a Tuesday to, to do something together. Amen. It's not unbiblical for us to enjoy spending time with one another, to grow a bond, first and foremost, in God's word, but also to grow an emotional bond with each other and a mutual affection for one another through actually spending time with each other. Because after all, we're in covenant with Christ together, and one day we will spend eternity with one another. And then most of all, this relationship of covenant ought to be with God. Grow in your relationship with the Lord. We all ought to strive for that. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. We've been looking at this book, and if John talks about anything, he talks about love, love for one another and love for God. But he says in verse 3, now by this we may be sure that we know him. We ought to all know him. Not in an intellectual way only. That's where it starts. Peter talks about that in 2 Peter, right? Add to your faith virtue and the virtue knowledge. He's talking about the knowledge where we grow intellectually. We learn about certain facts and certain truths about the Lord. But now he's talking about an intimacy ourselves with the God who brought us in covenant relationship with him through his son. 
We ought to know him. And John is implying this necessity of knowledge of him. And by this, he says, we may be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. Whoever says, I have come to know him, but does not obey his commandments is a liar, and in such a person the truth does not exist. But whoever obeys his word, truly in this person the love of God has reached perfection. By this we may be sure that we are in him. Whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk just as he walked. Our relationship with God is important. It's in fact the most important relationship that we can have. More important than our relationship with our spouse, though it's important. More important than our relationship with our children, though that is important. More important than the child relationship to their parents and their responsibilities to their parents. Our relationship to God is of the highest and of the utmost importance, not only because he created us, but also because he saved us, brothers and sisters. He deserves our first, our best, and our highest. He has made all great things in our life possible. God has. He is the one that has enabled you and your wife or you and your husband to have the great intimacy that you have. He is the one that enabled you to raise your children, to love him and to graduate and to reach higher heights. He is the one that we live, move, and have our very existence and our very being. He deserves our greatest and our highest. I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, progress in your relationships of covenant. Number three, and I won't be before you much longer. Just move along with me. We ought to progress and reach milestones, pass milestones, and reach other milestones in terms of character, our own personal growth of character. Now, I'll state this very quickly. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 very quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at what Paul is saying to this young man. And oftentimes we look at Paul's words to Timothy. I I believe that primarily that the preacher, the, the evangelist, must pay close attention to Paul's words to folk like Timothy. Both letters to Timothy and to Titus. But it does not exempt the everyday Christian from listening and heeding to much of what Paul is saying to this young man who preached the gospel. And what Paul is saying to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 11, he says this. He says, these are the things that you must insist on and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct in love and faith and purity. Until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy and the laying on of my hand, laying on of hands by the council of elders. Now look at what he says in verse 15. Put these things into practice. Devote yourselves to them so that all may see you or see your progress. Let everyone see, Timothy, that you're growing up in character. That as you're exercising these things concerning your faith, that you are becoming more and more like the Lord. In James chapter 1, what does James say? These things involve the character of the Christian. Oftentimes we want to be like Christ, but we all want to go through what Christ went through in order to be like Christ. But the Bible says in the book of James that if we want to be like Christ, there is a way that God fashions us in the image of his one and only son. It's through his word, but not only through studying his word, but it's also through what? Going through life, living, and trusting in his word. Look at what James chapter 1 says when you do that. He says in verse 2, my brothers, Whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Now, he's not telling you to look at the situation with joy, but he's saying have an attitude of joy because you understand the fruit of this particular situation and condition, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, if we were to go over to Romans chapter 5, Paul, by inspiration, says, and he shakes hands with James, He says suffering produces what? Endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces what? Hope. So when we're going through things, when when we've lost loved ones, when we're going through certain tests of life, things that are not necessarily God's will, but just things in life that God will use, we ought to not only consider it joy, but we also ought to know that we are being built up in our character. Amen? 
that we're being built up in our character. And this ought to be our achievement, our, our desire, and we ought to strive for it. And I know it's difficult when we have lost a loved one. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard when our children may be acting worldly or may have left the church or whatever it may be. In this life, there are so many troubles. And when we experience them, it's not always easy to look at it and say that God is doing a great work in me. But we ought to do that and we ought to keep that in mind. Because when we do, when we trust him and when we entrust ourselves to his work, God is making us better in character for tomorrow than we were today. And then better than we were yesterday. This is why the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. He had already talked about what? Being protected by faith. But he also begins to develop this wonderful truth. That it's only by a faith that has been tested that is able to protect you. Amen. We are protected from all of the evils and all of the errors of this world. Because of our faith in the Lord Jesus but God, in order to help us through all situations, he has to test and harden and perfect our, our faith and protect, perfect us so that we develop the character that is able to withstand. So progress in your character by, in essence, say, preacher, what do you mean? Accept suffering and affliction in life. And let God do his work in your life. We ought to progress in spirituality. Matthew chapter 4. We ought to progress in spirituality. Jesus says that man does not live by bread alone. You think that was just for, to quote to the, to the devil to leave him alone? Or was he telling us something? Man does not live by bread alone. In other words, Jesus is saying that there is a greater part of you than what you see with the natural eye. And though it is true and necessary that you sustain yourself with the physical foods and the physical things in life, he says, but that's not all. You have to think about a spiritual man. And that spiritual man does not live by bread or by meat. It does, he does not live by the sustenance that feeds the physical man. Man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We ought to have that attitude. Do you have that attitude this morning? Because we ought to progress spiritually. We ought to progress. And in order to progress spiritually, you ought to have the attitude that I must feed first and foremost the spiritual man. You're not, nobody in here is going to die because they put off a meal for another hour to study the word of God. We ought to put God's word first. We ought to put and make it the highest priority instead of study, striving, should I say, for all of the riches and all of the monies and all of the, the, the accounts that will give us some level of security. We ought to strive for what? Eternal security by ensuring that we're growing spiritually every single day. Every day. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 about the importance of his disciples hungering and thirsting after righteousness. In other words, we ought to seek to satisfy our spiritual man more than our fleshly man. That's important and that's necessary, but we ought to do that. You know, even our soul, because our, the spiritual man really transcends and in, in importance the soul. This part I'm referring to that deals with our pride of self and deals with our accomplishments. We ought to seek to please him by feeding our spiritual man. Look at it for really uh, uh, briefly. Turn to a couple of psalms just to put us in remembrance. Then we're going to give you one more milestone and then the lesson will be yours. But look at Psalm 42. We ought not ignore this because it's uh, an Old Testament writing because the spirit with which David writes this is something that we all ought to have. In fact, it is the same spirit that the Lord Jesus it had when he lived on the earth. That's what the Hebrew writer says in talking about Jesus, in referring to Jesus, he says, concerning Jesus, in the scroll of the book is written of me, about his zeal to do the Father's will. We ought to hunger. Look at verse number one, Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. 
When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me continually, where is your God? But some folks say, well, yeah, but when David wrote this, so when this psalm was written, it was written because the, the psalmist had sinned. And it doesn't matter what brings us to him. As long as we know the need to hunger and thirst after him. And sometimes my sin wakes me up, Brother Paul, and lets me know that I need him every day and every hour. Look at the psalmist and what he says in Psalm 63. Verse number one. He says, oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. Does your Bible say that? There is nothing in this life that you can pursue that equates a pursuit for him. We ought to strive to grow spiritually. And the way that we grow spiritually is desiring spiritual things, longing for the one who has quickened our spirit and given us life. We ought to hunger and thirst for him. That's what spirituality is. That's what develops us spiritually. Looking past, you know, we spend so much time in recreation, so much time in television, so much time in sporting events, and all of those things, those are good things, they're okay, they're permissible, but they're not the main things in life. They're not the eternal things in life. We ought to strive for spirituality. And then finally, we ought to think about the milestones in our expectation and in our excitement of the eternal promises. We ought to grow more and more in our expectation of heaven. More and more every day. One more passage of scripture. Romans 13. I know I've kept you over. Romans 13. Look at what the Apostle Paul is saying. We ought to keep this in mind. I'm not sure how many of us see this little statement that Paul makes. Seems rather um, obscure than the language that Paul has used in the past. We know Paul, of course, spoke these words, but because it seems almost obscure, we ought to pay close attention to what Paul is saying here, I believe. And as Paul is, is urging them about waking up, look at verse, let's start with verse, Romans 13, let's start with verse, he talks about love. Verse 8, owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, so Paul gives them another doctrinal and biblical evidence as to why they ought to pursue these things. He says, besides this, you know what time it is. This is 2,000 years ago. First century saints, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. Isn't that powerful? And the day that you obey the gospel, whether it was 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, you are nearer to your salvation today than you were, even yesterday. Amen. Not only is it time for us to wake up, but we ought to grow in our expectation of seeing the Lord's face. And again, being with our loved ones that have died in the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? I'll say it again. I long for that day when we can be together again. And we ought to grow in our expectation of our heavenly home. How do you think we overcome temptation and sin? It's through that expectation. How do you think we overcome the rigors and the false doctrines in this world? How do you think we conquer? What does the Bible say? Through that expectation of our hope. What does John say in his letter? He says we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. But when it is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. Isn't that what he says? And all who have this hope in him in this life, Marvin, 
purify themselves just as he is pure. Does your Bible say that for John? Purify themselves. It's through that expectation that we overcome. It's through looking, looking to heaven that we overcome. We ought to grow in our expectation and we ought to grow in our excitement of our eternal promise of being resurrected with him. This is how we overcome. So we don't just talk to our graduates today, whether they're in this audience, whether they're listening virtually, or whether it's just someone sees this next year. We're talking also to every saint, every believer in the Lord Jesus that we ought to progress. And we only talked about five. We ought to progress in the necessary things in life. And so we implore you today that first and foremost, if you're here or listening virtually and you're not a Christian, we want to urge you right now to obey the gospel. In other words, progress, can I say that? Progress from death to life by obeying the gospel. The gospel is not just something to be believed. The Bible says it's something to be obeyed. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible implies that there are two kingdoms present today in this world. There's the kingdom of Satan, there's the kingdom of darkness that most of the world dwells in, and then there's the kingdom of God's beloved Son. We're asking you today, we're urging you today, we're beseeching you today that if you have not obeyed the gospel, won't you put Christ on in baptism and be transferred out of the kingdom of the devil, transferred out of his kingdom and transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Come in covenant relationship with God through His Son, and then have this expectation of, of eternal life. We ask you to do this through faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. We can look at it, uh, for example, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, about obedience to the gospel, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. There are so many passages of scripture that talk about obeying the gospel and the, the need to do so. And we urge you to do that again through faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And God promises upon your obedience to the gospel that on that day when he receives his own to himself and that he will give you the crown of life that no man can take away. Provided you walk faithfully unto death. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. So we implore you today that if you need to come, come. And if you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, and we do, we implore you so much today, we ought to be more dedicated in the Lord's church we do. God's people ought to dedicate ourselves to the spiritual and the necessities of life. We are commissioned, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, with the gospel, to carry the gospel into the world. The church, not America, but the church is the pillar and the bulwark of the truth. We ought to be as Christians carry the truth into the world. We cannot do that if we're not progressing in the word ourselves. And so we implore you today as Christians, if you need to come, come right now as well. While we all together.